Galatians chapter 3, and I remind you that in the opening verses of the chapter, uh, the Apostle Paul asked the churches of Galatia five questions to remind them that they received the Spirit of God by the hearing of faith and, and not by the works of the law. So he used their own experience to prove that they were not justified uh, by the works of the law. He then turns to the example of Abraham to further prove his point because Abraham too was accounted righteous by the hearing of faith, not by the works of the law. The law hadn't even been given yet. And so he uses the example of Abraham. And so, you know, we pointed this out last time. It's important to understand the principle of God counting a man righteous by faith is not a new thing. It has historic precedent predating the law, going back to Abraham. Now, Paul certainly received new revelation, uh, but... His ministry is not in contradiction and violation of God's righteous principles. The Lord said, I am the Lord, I change not. The Bible says Jesus Christ the same, yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change in who He is. He doesn't change in His righteousness. But He does obviously change in His dealings with man according to progressive revelation as he reveals more. Uh, so there's certainly new revelation that came in through Paul's ministry, but nothing in Paul's ministry violates anything in the Old Testament. It may be different, it's further revelation, but the Bible is still one book in harmony with itself. Okay, and so when you, when you understand dispensational truth, you realize there are no contradictions in the Bible. If you didn't understand how to rightly divide, there would seem like contradictions. But right division shows you there actually are no contradictions. So let's read the passage again. I'm going to review a little bit because repetition is good for learning. I'm going to review a little bit of what we talked about last week and then try to go further, if not finish chapter 3. But um, we kind of took an overview, really. We didn't look at every detail, but we took an overview, verse 6 to 22, and we saw that the basic argument of the passage is to show the distinction and superiority of God's promise to Abraham and his seed over the law that he revealed through Moses 430 years later and, and how that promise relates to Gentiles, believing Gentiles in the age of grace. Okay, so that's basically what's going on in the passage. I want to read the passage again, and then we're going to uh, remind you of some highlights of it, and then try to work further down, maybe to the end. In fact, we may just go ahead and read all the way down to the end. Okay, let's start in verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And thee shall all nations be blessed. Now it said the scripture foreseeing. It didn't say foretelling and revealing and explaining. Paul's going to show us in this passage there was a hidden purpose that Abraham himself didn't know about when God made promise to him. There were things about it he didn't really get. But now we know through Paul and what he writes here by inspiration of God. It's interesting he said, and these shall all nations be blessed. That's the gospel being referred to. Gospel simply means good news. There was good news given to Abraham, and here it is, and these shall all nations be blessed. I talked about how most people say that's what is said in Genesis 12, 3. But in that verse it says families. It says nations here. It makes me think more of possibly Genesis 22, which if that's the case, that's very interesting because in Genesis 22, 18, he talks about how in thy seed all nations be blessed. Well, here it says in thee, but of course we see in the passage that includes his seed in thee, which would be his seed, which would be Christ, all nations be blessed. Now, if you know anything about Genesis 22, okay, Psalm 22 is the prophecy of the cross, but Genesis 22 is the picture of the cross. Isaac, 
being offered up on that altar. And Abraham was willing to do that because he believed God was going to raise him from the dead. That's why he told the men that traveled with him, wait here, I and the lad will go yonder and worship. We'll come back in three days. <laughs> On the third day. I've preached the message out of that before Genesis 22. Beautiful picture, amazing picture. And, and Isaac pictures Christ, how he went to the cross. And you have a lot in there. To, 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 so if that's the case, if he's alluding to that, how fitting that he would mention Genesis 22, 18 because... It's on the basis of, of Christ and, and what He would accomplish through His death, burial, and resurrection. And that's pictured in Genesis twenty two eighteen, 18. Verse 9, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. We're blessed with imputed righteousness, God counting us righteous. For as many as are the works of the law are under the curse. So you want blessing? Well, you, it, it comes through faith. But if you, if you put yourself under the law to do the works of the law to try to earn the blessing, you're going to wind up being cursed instead of blessed because he says, For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Okay, and we, we, we mentioned that the law is not a cafeteria. You don't, you don't get to go into the law and pick and choose. I mean, it's a unit. And so you got, if you want to be under the law and be blessed and justified by that, you got to do all of it all of the time. Good luck. Well, it's not going to happen. You'll wind up cursed. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Live. That comes by faith. What does the law produce? What does the law bring? What's the ministration of the law? Paul said it's death. In 2 Corinthians 3, for an example, he talks about that. Alright, the just shall live by faith. That's Habakkuk 2.4. Yet in that passage, it actually says the just shall live by his faith. Paul's careful to quote it by inspiration of God to say faith, not his faith, because in Habakkuk it's talking about a man's faith, but Paul in this passage is talking about the faith of Jesus Christ. That's how we're justified. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Okay, it's not of the, the faith of Christ is not revealed until Paul's ministry. If you skip ahead, look down to verse 23. But before faith came. Well, yeah, they, they had faith in the Old Testament. Read Hebrews 11. But the law is not of faith. It's not, it, the law, there's a distinction between being under the law and then being justified by the faith of Christ. He said, before faith came, we are kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. It's now been revealed. He's talking about the faith of Christ. It's in verse 22. We'll see it as we go along. So he says, um, the laws, verse 12, The law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. So through Jesus Christ, we're redeemed, purchased, bought back. We were under sin, under the bondage of sin and the law, but we're redeemed. We're no longer cursed. We're blessed. Uh, we receive His righteousness, His life, that the blessing of Abraham... And that blessing of Abraham in the passage is talking about God counting us righteous. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You know, he started out the chapter saying, how, do you re how did you receive the Spirit, the works of the law, or the hearing of faith? Well, here's the answer. It's obvious. It's, it's the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. He's making an illustration, saying even among men, when they make a, an, an agreement, a contract, a covenant, uh, once it's confirmed, you can't, you can't uh, say it's disannulled, you can't add something to it. He said, now, here's the point. Now, to Abraham and his seed were well, the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many but as of one into thy seed, which is Christ. Now the word seed, and we see it back in Genesis. It can be plural, obviously. 
And it is plural. But he's saying, look, because it says seed, it could also be singular. Now I'm going to show you there's a spiritual purpose here. There's something deeper here. There were promises given to Abraham that had to do with him and his literal physical seed, the nation Israel. But Paul's showing an application in regard to the key to it all. Whether you're talking about Israel or us, the key to it all is the seed as in Jesus Christ. Okay? So he's making a point on one little letter which shows you the precision of God's Word and preservation. Christ said, one jot or one tittle not pass from the law till all be fulfilled. God will preserve ever even jot and tittle. The preservation is so precise. He said, He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one unto thy seed which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise an effect. God gave that unconditional, everlasting promise when He added the law in His dealings with Israel later. It did not change what He had already promised. Abraham and his seed. For if the inheritance be of the law, it's no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of now it was added in the sense of his dealings with Israel. He had them, there was that covenant with Abraham, but then there's another covenant that's added in how he dealt with them. It was the covenant of law. It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come. So it's not permanent, it's till. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels and the hand of a mediator. That mediator is Moses. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one. So there, it was a contract between God and Israel. And he used Moses as the mediator when bringing them under the law. But God is one. So, so the promise is not between... The promise that God gave Abraham is based on God. It's not based on Abraham performing. But God keeping his word. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which should have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded, all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. That's the only condition. You simply believe. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You receive the promise, and the promise in the passage here is the promise of the Spirit, you receive it by faith of Jesus Christ. But before faith came, that would be the faith of Jesus Christ, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. That proves dispensational truth. A, di a dispensation is a dispensing of divine revelation. Paul's very plainly saying there was a time when we were kept under the law and God's dealings with man, he dealt according to law. And faith wasn't revealed. There was a faith not revealed then. Now it's revealed. And God's changed in his dealings with man because of this revelation. That's dispensational truth. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. For you all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And he's talking about a spiritual baptism. I know that because of verse 28. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male, uh, bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you're all one where? In Christ Jesus. That's spiritual. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ when we believe the gospel. And if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed? Because he's the seed of Abraham and we're in Christ. And heirs according to the promise. That promise is the promise of the Spirit, which we'll elaborate on that in the, in the lesson tonight. So, just reading through it, and I was trying to refrain myself from doing a lot of commenting, but man, there's a lot in there. But I, I, sometimes you can not see uh, the forest for the trees. 
So I think it's helpful to step back and try to, what's the big picture here? What's being said? What's the argument? What's, you know, we could spend forever going through every detail he brings up. Uh, but, you know, that's not my goal in this. I, I, my goal is that we'll have an idea and understanding of, you know, what this passage is all about. So, just to review some highlights before we move on further. God counted Abraham righteous by faith before circumcision. Okay, in Genesis 15, he believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. He got the token of circumcision in Genesis 17. It was before circumcision, and obviously it was before the law. So there's precedent there of God counting a man righteous by faith. So even we Gentiles, we can believe God and be counted righteous without circumcision, without the law. You see the false teachers were coming in the churches of Galatia saying you can't be right with God without circumcision and the law. The point is, what about Abraham? And you brag on Abraham being your father. He was counted righteous before circumcision, and obviously before the law. And when the law came in, it didn't change the promise God made to Abraham. And that promise God made has an impact on us. So God made an everlasting and unconditional promise to Abraham and his seed that the law, which came 430 years later, cannot disannul. Okay? And so... The fact that Abraham was given an everlasting and unconditional covenant concerning a nation and concerning a land and, and uh, all the things God said to him. In fact, if you go to Genesis 12, you see seven things mentioned. Let's go ahead and look at that real quick. Genesis 12. I mean, I was looking at my notes today of everything about Abraham. I made an outline. I think it was ten points tracing through the process of God reve revealing things to Abraham promising him things, confirming those things. I'm not going to get into all that. There's no way we can do that tonight in this study. But just a reminder, the first thing he says to him in Genesis 12, just to, get, just to put it in your mind of, of what he promised, in verse number 1, Genesis 12, 1, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country. See, his name is changed to Abraham, which means father of many nations. But here it's Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house to a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I'll bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now that's not limited just to Abraham because that is repeated in the book of Numbers concerning the nation Israel. And the issue with Balak. Uh, and all that's going on when they, you know, they were trying to curse Israel. God said, well, I will bless them that bless thee, curse them that curse thee. And he's applying that to the nation Israel, the seed of Abraham. Okay. Um, so he said, did I finish reading verse 3? And these shall all families of the earth be blessed. So you, it, this, it's got to do with him being, becoming a great nation. It's got to do with, as, as we're going to see later on, as it's confirmed, he gives him a land of promise and you trace it through you you know study Genesis 12 he, he mentions it uh, again in 13 and 15 and 17 and uh, 8 I mean all through there in his dealings with Abraham we're not going to read all that Genesis 22 you can look at all these passages and, and about the promises and the confirmation of that and so on and it's going to be through Isaac not Ishmael which was of the flesh and how that occurred, but God was faithful and gave him a promised seed, a miraculous thing there with him and Sarah having Isaac uh, at their age when it was impossible. Okay, so, man, there's a lot. I'm taking it for granted on Wednesday night in this church that you folks know about Abraham, okay? And this kind of goes back to what I said, you know, Sunday about studying the Old Testament. I mean, how are you going to understand Galatians 3 if you don't know anything about the Old Testament? You see? So, back to Galatians. This implies eternal life. How's Abraham, if it's an everlasting possession... And Abraham looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham never fully walked in all that God has for him. Study Hebrews 11 about that. 
They're sojourners, dwelling in tents, still looking. Well, it'll all be fulfilled. Because he's going to have resurrection and eternal life. Right? So these, these promises imply that he's going to have life, you see. It's important to note that. Eternal life. So, in this present age, all who believe God, as Abraham did, are blessed in Christ according to promise and not by the performance of the law. So Abraham then is our father in a spiritual sense of our example. Okay, We're not Jews because in the body of Christ there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's some people that teach, oh, we become Jews and we're Israel. No, we're not. We're a new creature. Abraham's our father in a spiritual sense because he's our example of faith. But those who are under the law are cursed because no man can continue in all things which are written in the law for him to do. So the law does not bring blessing, ultimately brings a curse, and it does not give life, it brings death. But Christ redeems us from the curse of the law because He was made a curse for us. How was He made a curse for us? Because He was made to be sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For He hath made Him, the Father made Christ to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. What a transaction. Christ knew no sin, so He had to be made sin. We were not righteous, so we have to be made righteous. And it's because Christ fulfilled the law and then laid down that sinless life as a sacrifice to pay the, our debt to suffer under the curse of the law. And that's why Paul said in Galatians 2.19, I through the law am dead to the law. Because he said I'm crucified with Christ. The, the, the curse of the law has been met. It's been fulfilled. Christ bore it all on the cross to redeem us so that we're no longer under the curse of the law. And yet preachers to this day will stand up and tell people for an example, if you don't tithe, you've robbed God and you're cursed with a curse. Malachi chapter 3, tithing according to the law, and they're telling them if you don't do it, you're cursed. That's the curse of the law. You can't be cursed by the law if Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, curses everyone that hangeth on a tree. And yet, that's back in Deuteronomy 21, verse 23. And that's why Peter, for an example, by inspiration of God, when he talks about the cross, he calls it the tree. And Peter had something amazing to say in 1 Peter 2, 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree. That's an amazing statement. I think Peter knew more than some people give him credit who his own self, the Lord Jesus, bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness. So that ties in with this, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So I'm at the cross. Now, the law then was a temporary contract between two parties, God and Israel, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. When God gave the law, He used angels to speak things and to show things. And there's other verses on this. When you look at the law, it's a conditional covenant of your blessing or cursing in the land will be dependent on your obedience or disobedience. All right, Israel? If you obey my commandments, I'll bless you in your land. If you disobey, I'll curse you in your land and eventually kick you out of it. That's the bottom line of it. Study Deuteronomy 28. Okay, so the essence of law is performance. You've got to do in order to be blessed. The essence of grace is gift. I'll bless you freely. Now you ought to do out of love and gratitude. So the whole purpose of bringing the law in was to show just how sinful the flesh really is. Um, Romans 5.20, but the law entered that sin might abound. 
But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. <laughs> that sin might become exceeding sinful, that it might take on that characteristic of transgression. We've looked at verses last time in Romans about this. So it was, it was to be a schoolmaster. A schoolmaster to prepare us for something better revealed through Christ. So God, though, personally, not through angels, not through a mediator, but God personally made a promise based upon Himself and not the performance of Abraham. In Genesis 15, when it says, Abraham believed God and was counted him for righteousness, when God spoke to him about his seed, being as the stars for multitude and so forth, even though he didn't have a son yet. Um, if you study that chapter, what goes on after he makes that promise, he confirms it. He puts Abraham in a deep sleep. And there's this burning lamp that passes through the divided parts of these sacrifices, blood sacrifice. And of course, it's the presence of God, the burning lamp there signifying the presence of God. And the point is, it's going to be based on God and not Abraham. That's why Abraham's sleeping when this occurs. It's going to be based, it's confirmed, as Paul said, confirmed in Christ. That's the key. And therefore the promise is sure. Look at verse 18. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Look over quickly to Romans 4 in that regard. Romans 4. I told you before, you need to study Romans 4 in connection with Galatians 3. So if, if the inheritance be of the law, then is it no more of promise? But God gave to Abraham by promise. And a good cross-reference there is back to Romans 4, verse 14. Notice... Well, back up to verse 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world. He's going to be the father of many nations. He's going to, of his seed, going to be a great nation, which will become a kingdom of priests to all the other nations. And of course, ultimately, Christ being the king of the world. The promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. Why? Because the law worketh wrath. For no law is, there's no transgression. Now there can be sin, but transgression has to do with breaking the law. It's a, it's a, it's a, a specific term, okay? Therefore, notice verse 16, it is of faith that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. Now notice, not to that only which is of the law, but to that which also is the faith of Abraham, who's the father of us all. Now whether you're talking about the seed of Abraham that, that was then circumcised with that token of the covenant and that was required under the law and so on, the physical, literal seed, or the spiritual seed in the sense of those who believe like Abraham believed in, we are in Christ. He's the Father of us all. But this promise, it's by grace that it might be sure. Okay? So it's not based, if it was based on man's performance, the only sure thing about it is we'd fail. But it's based on God, and He cannot fail, and He cannot lie. And so, the promise is sure. Now, I know that's a lot to take in, but don't, don't let me lose you, okay? <laughs> if I have, <laughs> maybe I already have. I'm trying. Um, God, get this, get this real good. God made promises to Abraham and his literal physical seed through Isaac now. Not just, I mean, Ishmael was the seed of Abraham, but... Uh, he, the promise is not through Ishmael, it's through Isaac. God provided Isaac. He made promises concerning being a great nation and a great land to be a blessing to all nations. Now, the, that physical seed, I'm talking about Jews, okay? 
from Abraham comes the 12 tribes, the nation Israel, the Hebrews, and then we, you can use the term Jew. Uh, and there's a lot to study on that, but there's a verse that just came to mind. Let me see if I can find this real quick. Um, oh, ver, well, you don't have to turn there, but 2 Corinthians 11, 22, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are the seed of Abraham? So am I. So you see Hebrews, Israelites, seed of Abraham, okay? The seed of Abraham are Israelites. They are the Hebrews. And there's verses that talk about Jews, okay? A biblical term. And, um, but anyway, the point is, just because they're the physical seed doesn't guarantee they're going to enjoy the promises. His physical seed has got to believe God like Abraham did. Okay? And those that do are going to inherit and enjoy those literal promises made to Abraham. But it was revealed through the Apostle Paul that there was a hidden spiritual purpose in the promise. Okay, look, look at these verses again with that in mind. Verse 8, Galatians 3.8. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Abraham didn't have a clue of the depth of that as it pertains to being in Christ. The scripture foresaw it. Abraham didn't. He had a surface understanding. Okay, God's promising that in me all nations will be blessed. What Paul's saying about that, Abraham didn't know. There's something deeper here. Look at verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. How? Through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Abraham didn't have a concept of this, of what God would be doing for the Gentiles in this age through Jesus Christ. And we receive the promise of the Spirit by simply believing God. Again, verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made, he saith not to seeds as of many, but as of one to thy seed, which is Christ. So Abraham understood when God talked about his seed, he's talking about his posterity. It was, it was plural. It was the Hebrews. It was the nation Israel. But there's something deeper. There's something hidden there. Uh, concerning what God was going to do for the Gentiles through the seed, Jesus Christ in particular. So what I'm saying is there's things Paul talking about here. It, it's not explained like this in the Old Testament at all. This is, this is new information. This is new revelation. So that in this age, Gentiles may receive the blessing of imputed righteousness... And the promise of the Spirit through Christ, who is the seed of Abraham. But that being the case, here's the point. The spiritual purpose in that, that was revealed to Paul, does not disannul the literal understanding of what God gave Abraham concerning his physical, literal seed. In other words... People come in this passage and they try to say, see, God's finished with Israel. Now all believers today are Israel and it's all spiritual. No, there is a spiritual element, but that spiritual element does not do away with what was literal. There, and, and, the, and you can prove that by Romans 11. Look at Romans 11. Nowhere does Paul teach that we are now Israel. In fact, in Galatians, he distinguishes the new creature, the body of Christ, from Israel. Nowhere does Paul say we're going to get the land, that we're going to be a nation in a land. No, he doesn't do that. He's talking about imputed righteousness. He's talking about life. He's talking about blessing in that regard. It's a spiritual purpose hidden in there. But just because that spiritual purpose has been revealed doesn't do away with what was originally said. That's why he said in Romans 11, 
verse number in the whole chapter needs to be studied in this regard. But let me give you a couple verses here at the end of the chapter. In Romans 11, verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened unto Israel until... So it, there were some Jews that believed. Not all of them rejected their Messiah. It's in part... And it's until, it's not permanent, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. So he's talking about Israel that needs to be saved. So if we're Israel, how does that even make sense? We are saved. No, he's talking about a literal nation, a physical nation that must be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and he shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. And that's going to be under the new covenant he makes with the house of Israel. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. So if you're going to say that, that when you read Israel in Paul's epistles, it's the church, then you've got the church being the enemy of the gospel. <laughs> no, he's talking about a literal nation. Physical nation. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those promises must be fulfilled. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. I'm glad God is faithful to fulfill everything He said to them because if He wasn't, what about us? Okay? So this is how it works. Paul comes in and he shows a spiritual... Meaning in this that Abraham didn't even understand. But God did, obviously. The Scripture foreseeing. But just because this, this spiritual purpose is now revealed does not change what originally was said to Abraham about his literal seed. Okay? So, here's, I'm going to make this point, and it's important to understand this. The church, which is the body of Christ where there's neither Jew nor Gentile, but it's one new man, one spiritual body in Christ. That was a mystery, a secret, that was hid in God, that nobody knew until it was revealed through the Apostle Paul, according to what Paul said in Ephesians 3, for an example. But the Gospel's not that way. The Gospel was hid in the Old Testament. Okay, There's, there's a distinction here. That's why Paul said the gospel by which we're saved is that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that He was buried and that He was raised the third day according to the Scriptures. And he, you see Paul when it comes to the God. That's why he's using Abraham to teach us things about be, being justified by faith. Our, the gospel by which we're saved wasn't understood and preached as good news till Paul said he got it by a revelation of Jesus Christ. But there are things in the old... It was hid in there. There were things back in the Old Testament. It was hid in the Old Testament, but the body of Christ was hid in God. There's a distinction there. Okay? And understand that. People get confused on those things. So back in Galatians, let's find a place to stop here. It's going to get easier as we go through. I mean, it started out kind of easy. It's getting a little tough, and then it'll get easier as we finish up in Galatians, okay? Now, uh, but I wanted to get further, but I'm not really going to get any further tonight. We'll have to finish Galatians 3 next time. But just notice in verse... Well, let's just finish with verse number um, 22. Here, here's really where it all leads to. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin. That would be Jew and Gentiles, all. We're under sin. That's why we need redemption. To be under sin is to be in bondage. Cursed. Worthy of death. But He redeemed us. The Scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. 
I'm not going to do it now. We'll do it next time. But in Romans 3, he said, we before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. And I like how he shows, he quotes from seven Old Testament passages to show we're all sinners. He said, as it is written, and he gives you verse after verse because it's the sword of the Spirit. It's the two-edged sword of the Word of God convicting, showing the Scripture hath concluded all under sin. Therefore, we've got to have the promise by faith of Jesus Christ. That's our only hope. And it's given to them that, that believe. So we'll go to Romans 3 and look at some of that next time. But... What it's setting us up for is this issue of by faith of Jesus Christ. Now, we've talked about that some already, and we'll elaborate more on that in the next lesson. But I want to finish tonight by looking at this thing of that the promise. Okay, that promise is verse 14, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, don't miss this. Let me finish with this thought. Don't, I know it's the end, but instead of putting your shoes back on and closing your Bible and zipping it up and all that, Listen to this. The promise of the Spirit through faith. Verse 29. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. He's not saying we're now going to inherit the land. Okay? When he says heirs according to the promise, what promise? The promise of the Spirit. What is the promise of the Spirit? We receive the Holy Spirit by faith, but what does the Holy Spirit do, for an example? Look in Ephesians 1. We'll, I promise <laughs> we'll finish with this. Ephesians 1, verse, this is where you've got to connect it to. He's not talking about the land at all. Ephesians 1, verse 13. In whom you also trusted after you heard of the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of what? Promise. Okay. Explanation. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. So the Holy Spirit seals us and He is the earnest or the guarantee that we're going to get this inheritance. If God put His Spirit in us, He's going to finish the deal. We're going to be glorified in the image of Christ to an inheritance. And what is that inheritance? Back up in Ephesians 1 and look in verse 8. Wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure which He hath purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times... He might gather together in one. That's the eternal state, where the culmination of everything. All things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on, are on earth, even in Him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. We get an inheritance, and where is ours? In heaven. Everything Paul says about our inheritance has to do with heaven. He said we're going to get a body eternal in the heavens. He never says anything about the earth. He never says anything about the land. He never says anything. So we don't get that. That's still to the literal physical seed of Abraham. God brought in a spiritual purpose, something hidden in there. And you can kind of see it hinted at when he said, I'll make your seed like the stars of heaven and like the dust of the earth. The heavenly people, the earthly people. It's tied into Abraham. Why? Because Christ is the seed of Abraham. Israel can't get a new covenant without Christ. And we can't have an inheritance without Christ. Everything God does, whether you're talking about Israel or the body of Christ, is all centralized in Jesus Christ. And so, man, you got to watch out for this stuff because people, they, they come in these passages like Galatians 3 and Romans 4 and they want to try to say, now, okay, now we're Israel and we're the Jews and we get everything God said. No, there is an application in one sense, in a spiritual sense. There's a hidden purpose in there, but that doesn't change the literal meaning of what he said to Abraham. There's both the earthly people and the heavenly people. That's how he can bring in Abraham to this and make these points that he's making. Okay, 
So what we're gonna it's all by the faith of Christ, and that's where we're gonna have to pick it up next time in Galatians 3, as he goes on to show that the law is is a schoolmaster bringing you to Christ that you might be justified by his faith and and uh, once you hey once that per, that purpose has been fulfilled now that we're in Christ good night what do we need to go back to the schoolmaster for and that was the trouble in Galatia they were going back to the schoolmaster and uh, and so he's gonna boy there's a I'm looking forward to as we finish chapter three and really what he says at the end of three develops into chapter four about having the spirit of adoption as far as being full-grown sons and all that that entails. There's a lot to get into, but I hope that helps. I, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm just making it worse <laughs> in terms of there's so many details in there. you got to really think it through. You can't, you know, I know you folks know this, but there's a lot of churches. They're accustomed. You, you come to the front door, check your brain, come on in. You're not going to need it because you're going to be entertained with stories and songs. And, but you got to think about these things. And if you begin to understand this spiritually, there's great blessing in it. Good night. I mean, you know, hey, this stuff, we're tied in. We're no afterthought. The body of Christ is no afterthought. God had us in mind when He was talking to Abraham. In fact, we're His purpose before the world even began. And so, I love how the Scriptures have divisions and yet connections and how they tie together like they do in many cases. It's wonderful. Let's pray. Father, thank You.